Miigwech, Elder Sue. Welcome to Massey College, Buzu, bienvenue. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers and I'm the principal of Massey College. Massey College is built on indigenous land, land that has been inhabited by many indigenous communities and by many survivors of residential schools. It is the land of the Huron Wandat, the Seneca, the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I want to acknowledge our duty to steward this land and the great privilege that we have here to be together. Today is a day of reflection on the terrible, tragical, dark chapter of our collective history. We owe a devoir de mémoire, as we say in French. We have a duty to remember, to acknowledge, to take stock of the past. We have a duty to act in the present so that we can imagine, construct, and redo a better future. I want to thank everybody here for being here today for this participation, the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation Massey Ceremony. Our speakers, to whom I am particularly indebted uh, today, I want to thank uh, Guy Malaforme, uh, that I will introduce in a few minutes, Chief of the Mississaugas of the Credit, Her Honor, the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, the Honorable Elizabeth Dowdswell, the Honorable Doug Ford, Premier of Ontario. We have two junior fellows uh, here of Indigenous descent, James Byrne and Rina Roussin, and we will have a, a junior fellow, Maeve Palmer, who will uh, greet us with a, a, a musical interlude at the end of our ceremony. I want to recognize uh, in the crowd, if I don't recognize you, you're still very special because everybody that's here, I think we are so indebted that you are part of this important ceremony for Massey and also for Canada. So I want to recognize the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly of Ontario, the Honorable Ted Arnott, and uh, Councillor Irma Farrell, who is with us from the Mississaugas of the Credit, Deputy Minister of Indigenous Affairs, Sean Baptiste. If you want to purchase an orange shirt uh, and a button, you pay as much as you can, and the proceeds are going to Namarez, an organization that the Mississaugas have selected. It is based in Toronto and provides a safe space for indigenous men to live healthy lives on and off the streets. So without further ado, let me give the podium to Gima Laform. Thank you. Thank you for that warm round of applause. That's okay. I, I know that you know in ceremonies and in speeches sometimes it's it's hard to tell you know when to applaud and when to be quiet and trust me I'll let you know. Ani Bazu Nagani and Nishnebek and any stational form Disnikas Credit Dunjaba Mayinga Dodum Mississauga Nishnabe Dao. I'd um, like to acknowledge the Creator, the world around us and our place within it. I'd like to acknowledge the many nations that walked this land in the past, the many nations that walk it today, and welcome you to the territory and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe people. So I wrote, a, I wrote a speech on the way here, and if I can get it up on my phone, you'll hear it. So be before I begin, I'd like to offer you a a prayer. We give thanks to the Creator for allowing this gathering. We ask that He guide us and forgive us when we falter and disappoint. For though we aspire to greatness, we are after all only human. Grant us a clear mind, a pure heart, and courage. A clear mind to make intelligent, well thought out decisions. A pure heart to make decisions that are without personal bias and desire. And the courage to use both a clear mind and a pure heart in our lives. Let us set aside small differences. Let us concentrate on real issues. Let us not be bogged down in rhetoric. Let us live each day with a feeling of accomplishment and pride. Most importantly, let us remember we are not adversaries, nor are we enemies. We share a similar past, a kindred spirit, and a common heritage. We must always remember the real reason we gather, to do the right thing for our people, our children, 
our future. Miigwech. So, I want to start off this day, and I know um, Nat, Nat will get offered to play the video for this, and, and I should have took you up on that, but since we didn't, I, I want to recite this, this poem that I wrote on the day of the uncovering of the 215 children. Um, it's called Reconciliation 215. I sit here crying. I don't know why. I didn't know the children. I didn't know the parents. But I knew their spirit. I knew their love. I know their loss. I know their potential. And I am overwhelmed by the pain and the hurt. The pain of the families and friends. The pain of an entire people. Unable to protect them. To help them. To comfort them. To love them. I did not know them. But the pain is so real, so personal. I feel it in my core, my heart, my spirit. I sit here crying, and I am not ashamed. I will cry for them and many others like them. I'll cry for you. I'll cry for me. I'll cry for the what could have been. Then I'll calm myself, smudge myself, offer prayers, and know they are at peace. They are no longer in pain. In time, I will tell their story. I will educate society so their memory is not lost to this world. And when I am asked, what does reconciliation mean to me? I will say I want their lives back. I want them to live, to soar. I want to hear their laughter, see their smiles. Give me that, and I'll grant you reconciliation. So, when I wrote that, I was hurting, angry, sad, grieving. But I didn't write it to say that there is no possibility of reconciliation because you can't give me what I asked for. I wrote it so that you would understand the depth and breadth of the issues that we're speaking of. You know, we've talked of reconciliation in the past. And to me, we've talked about issues that are important but dwell on the surface of our lives. And this poem to me says, there's so much more work that we have to do. So that, that's why I wrote, wrote that poem. And as you can tell, it's a very, it was a very emotional poem to write and, and, and to read every time. So. so today is about the truth and loss, reflections and pain, strength and resilience, the truth of the past, the loss of our children, our hope, but the strength of a people who survived. As we look back, we must decide what steps we will take to safeguard our future. You know, it's also about, today's also about, and we can't ignore it, the world around us today, and the many losses we have all felt, the division that's caused by the pandemic. You know, it's a challenging time in the world with everything that's going on. And we will act to protect ourselves in these moments and we will act to protect our loved ones in these moments. And we must act to make the, the world a better place in these moments. It's an obligation. We owe it to the past, we owe it to the children, and we owe it to the future. So it's time to use our voice. When I look around, I don't see just people who are coming to offer their respect and love and coming to say their support. I see allies, and I see people who I hope are committed to making the world better. So that's what I see when I look around. Now, I'm going to do another poem. Oh, well, I, I, if it's okay with Natalie, it's okay. Um, and, and I should say that I wrote this for, for a different event, but I think it's fitting. You know, we, and so I'll just start into it. We were promised. We live in a world that has such beauty, yet that beauty is overshadowed. Even our mother, the earth, cries. We are losing any sense of connection to our planet, to each other. Our future is no longer promised. It was not supposed to be this way. We promised love, happiness, and safety when we came to this world. 
You have seen promises do not possess the ways they once did. No longer are they born in the heart and formed in the soul, but are merely words of convenience that flow from unconsidering lips. We were promised. As each promise fell, so too did we. But we still need them. Never has it been more apparent. We need to reclaim the promise that we're all born into, that we have a right to. Stand with me. Take my hand. Let us remember and let truth emerge from the heart and spirit, a commitment that shall not break nor wither with age, but only grow stronger in time. Let us build on our promise and heal wounds. I promise to be better, to do better. I promise to love, honor, and care for our mother the earth. I promise to ensure our children grow up and do not live under the shadow of violence. I promise to embrace the things in life that make you and I different. I promise that I will love you even though I may not know you. I shall not forget the past or the broken promises, but neither shall I dwell. I embrace this moment of truth and hope. I will carry this idea, this dream, this reality into our future. This is the truth we can stand on, build on, before the Creator, in front of the world, from my heart and soul, all this I promise. You know, when I, when I make that promise for myself, I hope that some of you would make that promise with me. So, now, I know I'm all over the board here, but I want to say that today we remember our losses and pain, and we reflect upon all those who didn't come home, all those who lived through the residential school system, and all those who live through it still. And um, I, I just want to say that the pain and hurt and the grief, grief of these losses has been strong. And I am so hopeful because people understand that this is not just the loss, only the loss of indigenous children. This is the loss of our children, of this country. And we have to make it right somehow and we will so now one more thing before i wrap up just because we're outside in this beautiful trees in this open court here this is fantastic space which is why i have a room right over there <laughs> but um but i want i want to say that um it, this reminds me of the other issue we face in this world which is climate change and they're all tied together. When you're talking of reconciliation, you're talking about everything. You know, you're talking about the world around you and your place within it. But I want to say, I challenge you, instead of thinking of climate change as a problem to be solved, think of Mother Earth as a soul to be saved. So, Chimagwitch, be safe, be heard, bama pi. You said this was my fault in my thing. Be gracious, your mother. Um, thank you so much. Great words of wisdom for all of us to ponder on and to promise. I'm uh, now delighted to invite to the podium uh, Her Honor, the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, Elizabeth Dalswa. Thank you, Chief Laform, for those powerful and moving words, as always. Premier. Today, people are gathering all across these lands on the traditional and unceded territories of Indigenous people who have stewarded them from time immemorial. But we gather in this very special place, the site of the Chapel Royal, Gichitwa, Gimekwa, Mississauga, Anishnebek, Anam, Anik. A place where the Crown and Indigenous people come together in friendship to honor tradition and celebrate through ceremony. 
on this first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, Indigenous and non-Indigenous people are gathering together. And that's a crucial word, together. Together we acknowledge the far-reaching and devastating impacts of the residential school system. We mourn the children who were lost there. We lament the lasting wounds these schools created, the futures they stole. Together, we grieve the harm done to Indigenous cultures by the neglect and oppression of voices, the suppression of languages. And today, we recognize the essential nature of the work that was done by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But today, we also affirm that doing nothing ends here. We understand that so much more needs to be done in order to implement the calls to action and to provide peace and justice for all who have been impacted by the legacy of the schools. And we are shamed by the evidence of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. As a non-Indigenous person, I come humbly to acknowledge that this is a day for me to recommit to listening and learning, to witness, but also to act, doing whatever I can to foster reconciliation. Reconciliation depends on building relationships on a foundation of trust. And I'm so very grateful this morning as I look around that I see the faces of some very generous friends. Elder Sue, Chief LaForn, Knowledge Keeper Bird. You are friends whose words and wise counsel I have carried with me when I've had the privilege to bear witness throughout this province. I've heard the stories of trauma and pain from reclaiming Shingwak Hall to saving the evidence at the Mohawk Institute Residential School in Brantford. I've heard and seen the courage and resolution of Indigenous people facing dis discrimi systemic discrimination. From KI on Big Trout Lake to Quetico Provincial Park, and in spite of the barriers, these people survived. And I've witnessed genuine collaboration between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples working together to achieve the imperative of reconciliation. In our common vulnerability during this global pandemic, we've actually shared traditional and Western knowledge. We have, I think, a renewed sense of our interconnectedness and of our respect for our elders and for our environment. There are so many paths of possibility to creating a resilient world that works for everyone. So I have hope. Genuine and meaningful collaboration is absolutely vital. I was reminded of that just recently as Don Lavelle Harvard, president of the Ontario Native Women's Association, spoke at a conference that my office hosted called Shaping Sustainability. She described the process of policy development whereby Indigenous people are, yes, often consulted, but all too often only after the decisions have been made. And she told us young people are starting to say, that's not good enough. We need to have a say. We need to be there right at the beginning. So on this very first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, it is apt that we meet here among so many young scholars and in a place where leaders of the country, those who aspire to be leaders, have gathered many times to discuss how to shape the future, to secure a good future for all. Indigenous voices must be integral to these conversations. So may the dialogue sparked by this day of remembrance 
and the search for hope, the search for truth, inspire genuine co-creation. This, after all, is the kind of relationship that the treaties were designed to enable. And may the kinship affirmed by the treaties actually flourish, not just one day at a time, but every day of our lives. Thank you. Merci. Miigwech. Yuen. Thank you so much, Your Honour. So let me invite to the, to the podium the Premier of Ontario, the Honourable Doug Ford. Well, thank you. First, I want to thank the Honour, Honourable Elizabeth Dowdswell, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario and Chief Stacey LaForme for joining us here today. Natalie, I want to thank you as well for hosting us, and I want to as well add uh, Deputy Minister Batiste. Thank you for all your support, and Mr. Speaker, thank you for being here today. People in Ontario and across Canada wear orange shirts on this day to remember and honour. The many Indigenous children taken from their communities and families and forced to attend residential schools. We observe Orange Shirt Day thanks to the courage of the residential school survivors like Phyllis Jack Webstead, who shared her experience of having her orange shirt given to her by her grandmother, taken from her on the first day attending residential schools. Tragically, there are thousands of residential school survivor stories of the long separation from families and communities that Indigenous children endured across our country. As we honour the survivors today, we must also not forget the countless Indigenous children who did not return home. Recent discoveries of remains found at a former residential school sites in Western Canada underscored the need for all Ontarians to learn about the lasting harms of the residential school system. September 30th also marks the first observance of a national day for truth and reconciliation. To commemorate those no longer with us and acknowledge the ongoing trauma that exists for residential school survivors, their families and their communities. For generations, Indigenous people have endured the harsh realities and impacts of residential schools. Ontarians need to face this dark chapter of our history and commit to taking action. I hope everyone can attend a local event today, be it in person or virtual, to learn more about the impact of residential schools. This is an opportunity for us to reflect and strengthen our relationships with the Indigenous peoples. And I'm so grateful, uh, Chief, for our relationship and First Nations uh, across the, the province. An opportunity for us to play an active role in supporting healing and reconciliation. Megwich, thank you. Thank you very much, Premier, for being here. Let me now invite Knowledge Keeper, Junior Fellow, Residential School Survivor, Graduate Student in Architecture, James Bird. Feathers here. I'm not the only one. And thank you. Sanajene Holia do Janese. I first want to acknowledge our guests and hosts this morning. Your honor for attending. Masi Cho, your honor. Mr. Premier, 
thank you as well for attending this morning here at Massey Muscle Tour. Our elder Gary So, always a pleasure to see him, and our chief, my friend, uh, and an honorary fellow actually here, uh, Chief Stacy Lafour. Our gracious host, Natalie Delose, for the generous and wonderful uh, hospitality this morning, the use of this venue. This is an incredible day. Upon this day, we offer our collective hopes and prayers for a better Canada. National Truth and Reconciliation Day brings a moment where all Canadians can begin to help Canada confront her role in a horrific past, acknowledge responsibility, and actively work to achieve healing. A healing moment not just for Canada's First Nations peoples, but for all Canadians. My hope as a survivor is that this is not just a one-day event. My hope is that this day represents the start where all Canadians begin to individually review our consciousness when it comes to the horrific history and help guide Canada collectively into a better tomorrow. And when September 30th appears again on our national calendar, we commit to a year-long journey of national healing. Let this day represent the start and a national healing journey. And let us never forget, ever, that this day happened because children's bodies were found. When Phil Fontaine, former National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, first announced that his office had successfully negotiated the Indian Residential School Agreement, hopes ran high amongst residential school survivors. This was in 2005. Now, along 16 years later, we're presented with a new day dedicated to helping create and cement into the national consciousness the essential spirit of what the Truth and Reconciliation Movement means. This is only the beginning we are all left with much more to be done. The day the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was announced in June of 2008, I was watching the announcement with my father on television. My late father, himself a residential school survivor. After the announcement, he quietly shut the TV off and turned to me and asked, quote, how are we going to do this reconciliation thing? I was confused by his question. Uh, where we, I was confused by his question. I got my pages mixed up. He continued, how are we as First Nations people supposed to trust the federal government with this when we still all live under the Indian Act? An incisive remark, a blatant truth, and I have never forgotten it. The fact that the Truth and Reconciliation and the Indian Act don't really seem to fit into the same gesture of hope. They can't exist side by side. They are antithetical to one another. We, all Canadians, need to address ending the Indian Act, for a conflict exists in the coexistence of these two narratives. Truth and repression one must give up its hold to allow the other to flourish. If we, can on, if we can only acknowledge and act on that truth, then powerful moments in Canada await us all. And it is in this future that this hope resides. My sincere hope for this day is that we, as all Canadians, use this day as a powerful moment to move into a new era of inclusiveness, kindness, compassion. And so it is. I look to this future. Today I'm announcing day today I'm announcing on this day the establishment of a national conference to be held in the summer of 2022 with the assistance from both the Center for Indigenous Studies here at the University of Toronto and Massey College. This conference will add a call to the already existing 94 calls to action. This is call number 95, a call to end the Indian Act in Canada. 
Masi Chong. Son zona Z. Masi, Masi Chong. Uh, Rena Roussain, another junior fellow, a Métis with Haida Heritage, PhD student in musicology. Thank you. Tansweki Almatan, Rena Roussain, Dishnika, Sean. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rena Roussain. I'm a junior fellow here at Massey College and a woman of indigenous and European settler ancestry. Those of you among us who speak Michif will have figured out that I am Métis. I also have ancestry from the Haida Nation, as well as English, French, and Scottish heritage. I would like to begin today by thanking our honored guests from the provincial leadership. We are so honored by your presence here today. I did not grow up in my indigenous communities, but I did grow up in a part of the world, Vancouver Island, where it's common for indigenous people from numerous nations to lift their hands to express their gratitude. And so Elder Sue, Chief Lafon, James, my friend, my teacher, members of the Mississaugas, members of all indigenous nations who are with us, today I lift my hands to express my gratitude to all of you to thank you for your resilience, your leadership, and especially for the gift of your presence here today. I know I speak on behalf of the entire Junior Fellowship, the entire Massey community, when I say that words cannot convey how honored, how grateful we are for your friendship, for the relationships we are building between our communities, and for this chance to reflect and remember together with you today. When I was invited to speak at this ceremony, I will admit that I struggled very deeply. I believe very much in the power of words, and yet what words could I possibly say that begin to address Canada's legacy of colonialism, of deliberate acts of such unthinkable cruelty carried out against Indigenous children and families, not only in the residential school system, but also in numerous additional acts of functional genocide. And yet at the same time, what words could I say that might help us all move forward together today? And then I thought of the phrase written across so many of our shirts today and written across our hearts this morning. Words that are, to my mind, the map to the next steps we must take, the lights we have to see by as we work towards realizing reconciliation. Every child matters. Every child matters. Entire worlds live in this phrase. It is a reminder of what we have lost. It speaks to a future that we have yet to build. And yet, as I stand here saying these words, I also think about how often and how frequently in the history of our country, words have fallen short, have signaled empty rhetoric, have suggested promises that never came to fruition. And so what I want to ask today is that we make sure that when we say these words, we mean them and that because we mean them, we work together to realize them. In a space full of so many current and future leaders of academia, arts, education, law, and politics, I would be remiss if I don't say that actions speak louder than words. And so respectfully, I want to challenge every non-Indigenous person here today, the European half of my own identity included, before you leave the Massey Quad, think of one action, one concrete step that you personally can take towards realizing reconciliation. If you, like me, tend to live your life somewhat on the outspoken side, perhaps that looks like listening a bit more closely to what Indigenous people are saying. Or maybe it's learning about Indigenous history or the Indigenous language of whichever part of our country you are from. Maybe it's learning about the water crisis on reserves and writing to your political rep representatives. Perhaps it's donating to Indigenous schools in and around Toronto, where our children are learning about the beauty of their cultures, of the pride they should have in who they are. 
Whatever it is, whatever reconciliation looks like for you, one step, one action. Imagine how many steps closer we will move if we all take one step together. My remarks today come before a moment of silence that we will all share together. Silence is a gift. It gives us a chance to be still, to reflect, and to remember. And yet I want to ask you all, beyond the occasional necessity of these moments of reflection, when it comes to the necessity of reconciliation, please never be silent again. Tomorrow, in my experience, the media will move on. Life will go back to normal, and it would be easy and wrong to forget what we came here to remember. Reconciliation is not something we only think about on September 30th. It is something we live. It is something we live in our words, in our actions, in every step we take together to create a future where every child matters doesn't need to be a slogan, because instead, it will just be the truth. Merci. Thank you. May I ask you to stand? We will take a minute of silence in memory of all the children who did not come home. And I invite for the conclusion of our ceremony, Maeve Palmer, who's going to lead us in a really nice musical interview. Miigwech. Thank you to the Mississaugas and to Natalie for inviting me to share a song with you this morning, Esta Noche, This Night composed by Luigi Nono, speaks to the very personal and immediate suffering of those who have felt the centuries of oppression weighing upon them. It speaks of the beauty and the innocence of children, like the children taken from indigenous families by our residential schools. And it speaks to the fatiguing sadness of waking each day to find that so little has changed. Yet it leaves us with a promise with a determined optimism that there will come a better day and that that bright future will shine for the coming generations, a future that we must build together. Esta noche, tonight. Take from my eyes the mists of centuries. I want to admire things like a child. It is sad to awaken and see always the same thing, this night of blood, this endless mud. There must come a day that is different. It must be the light to come. Believe me what I say.
Miigwech, thank you all. That concludes our ceremony. I want to uh, thank on your behalf the members of the Kichi Trois, Kima Atkwe, Mississauga, Anishinaabe, Anami Atkwe, the Chapel Royal Committee for helping us put this program together, the Mississaugas of the Credit for uh, helping us and put the program together, all of you for being here, and Massey staff for making sure that everything went well. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you.